Okay, I want to start with a couple of definitions. Uh, I'm going to be using a few terms, and I want to define a couple of them right up front. Uh, one of them is cosmology. I've already used the word. Well, what is cosmology? In the broadest sense, it's a study of the structure of the universe. Now, there are other meanings as well, but that's the one I intend for this talk and for the book. There's a related term, cosmogony, and that's really the study of the history of the universe, the origin, uh, the how development to what we have today and possible is in the future. And it's uh, pretty obvious to me that much of what we call cosmology uh, more properly is cosmogony. There are just scads of books out there, probably hundreds of books on the market dealing with cosmology. And if you open it up and start reading it, they'll use the word cosmology again and again and again. But a good deal of what they talk about there is actually as cosmogony. But yet very few uh, authors will even acknowledge the existence of that other word. And um, it's most unfortunate, I think, that they, they don't really look at this. I like to talk about history, and I do in my book talk about the history quite a bit of ideas, because these ideas either uh, haunt you or some other way stay with you for a long time. And a large part of our ideas in the West and in science go back to the ancient Greeks. So two, three thousand years ago, we're still thinking about it. They thought the world uh, was eternal. They thought the universe was eternal. Why did they believe in an eternal universe? Well, uh, first of all, they had a hard time envisioning some way that the universe could come into existence through some sort of natural process. If you really think about that, that is a very tricky proposition. How do you go from having nothing and then having something? And when I mean nothing, I mean absolutely nothing, which is quite a bit less than what most of you think of when you think of nothing. But, okay? To, to, to truly have nothing, you have to have something less than nothing, actually. Because for one thing, space itself is a something. If I ask all of you to close your eyes, get very zen here, and start imagining you know, nothing existing, most of you would imagine empty space. But you see, space itself is a something. So to have nothing, you need to have no space at all. So then it raises all sorts of questions. Well, what would be here if, if space weren't here? Well, that's, never mind. I won't go into that. So that's a problem. How, how do you go from nothing, truly nothing, to something? And so the best way to just avoid that is just to avoid that, not even talk about it. But furthermore, their gods, and notice the plural and small g, were not much more than supermen. Think about it. You think of Apollo and, and Zeus and all those people. They, uh, those gods, they were just like super people. Uh, for instance, their gods generally were born, lived, and died at some point. They had uh, foibles just like human beings have. They weren't transcendent like the creator God of the Bible is, and so therefore they weren't capable of any kind of creative acts. They were um, actually within the universe themselves. So this, this caused a real problem for them. And what I find fascinating is that this idea of the eternality of the universe persisted well into the 20th century. Throughout much of the Christian era, many philosophers and scientists who many times profess Christianity, but at the very least were heavily influenced by Christianity, still believed in the eternal universe. I think many of you will recognize that that's not what the Bible teaches. So I'm always amazed at how many people <clears throat> believe something about the universe, not because of what the Bible suggested, but because of what the Greeks thought. The fine Christian apologists that they were. Okay, this, so this is inconsistent with biblical creation. I think that when it says in the beginning, uh, there in the first uh, words of the Bible, it truly is talking about the beginning, the beginning of matter and energy and space and, this is another one, time. I don't think before the beginning there was time. So it's, sometimes people ask, you know, well, what was here before creation? And and my answer is, well, here wasn't here then, and then wasn't then then either. So that doesn't work. <laughs> We're getting back to those philosophical questions, so let's try to avoid uh, those sorts of things. Okay, this is a uh, photograph of the Milky Way. And if you go out on a summer night, away from the lights, uh, dark, moonless night, and you look over in the, uh, across the sky, you can see a big streak of light going across the sky. We call it the Milky Way. It uh, call that because of the milky sort of appearance that it has. And Galileo... Uh, four centuries ago when he first began using the telescope for astronomy, looked up and he could see thousands of faint little stars uh, along the, uh, the Milky Way. And people began to deduce that uh, this was the layout of stars, at least in our immediate vicinity. 
and they begin to realize that the stars were laid out in probably some sort of flat distribution. This is just the inner portion of the Milky Way. This is actually a very nice uh, diagram done many years ago, the entire Milky Way. Uh, this is like a map of the world, uh, if you will. This would be the equator running across here, and that's the disk of the Milky Way. This is what would be the center. This section over here connects with this section over here. And this would be like the North Pole and the South Pole. So you can see that the Milky Way is a flat distribution. Most of the glow you see here are from uh, many uh, combined light of billions and billions of stars. And you see a few th things off the plane of the Milky Way. There are some dark lanes of dust running through the middle which blocks our view. And right here we're looking towards the center of that flat disk. And you generally can imagine the, the Milky Way being like a flat disk, a plate or a, or a coin or some object, like a hockey puck, uh, to a first approximation looking quite a bit like that. This is a photograph uh, a good friend of mine made, Steve, uh, Steve Miller. He's an amateur astronomer in northern Indiana. He took this with his telescope. This is the Andromeda Galaxy, or they used to call it the Andromeda Nebula. M31 is uh, probably the scientific term for it. And this is the nucleus of this thing, and it's uh, got uh, the disk of the material over like this. And there's a little faint companion. This is M32. We think it's a satellite of this particular galaxy. And that those two fuzzy patches are the galaxies involved here. The, um, all the other points you see there are stars within our own galaxy. They're probably hundreds or thousands of light years away from us. The, Milky, the, the Andromeda galaxy is a little over two million light years away from us. So there's quite a bit of difference in distance. Again, this is an amateur photograph. This is a professional photograph. It's oriented differently, but it's the same object. Much longer exposure. Here's the center of the galaxy, the disk. And up here is M32. So we're looking at a couple hundred billion stars here. And again, over two million light years, two million light years away from us. And a very beautiful object. And one of the big discoveries of the 20th century was that uh, our galaxy is just one of billions and billions of, other, of galaxies that exist uh, in the universe. <clears throat> that was something we take for granted today, but it's something that was discovered uh, really in 1924. Here's another one. Uh, uh, this is called M104, sometimes called the Sombrero Galaxy because it has a slight resemblance to a sombrero. And again, it's probably on the order, I'm going to guess, 20 million light years away from us, a bit farther away than Andromeda Galaxy. These other objects are stars within our own galaxy lying in the same direction and much closer to us than it is. Many galaxies have this kind of a spiral shape. In fact, we call these spiral galaxies. And uh, quite a bit of debate raged uh, 100 years ago just what these things were. Uh, they began discovering these things in the 18th century and into the 19th century. By about 1880, they pretty much decided that these objects, well, there are two theories. I'll just call it the nature of the nebula, the argument you had. Uh, one of them was that, uh, one of the ideas was that these objects were confirmation uh, of a hypothesis put forth by a great French mathematician by the name of Laplace. We call it the nebular hypothesis. This is an origin scenario for the solar system. He thought that the uh, solar system started from a large cloud of gas and dust, and this large cloud contracted gradually. Most of the material f fell to the center to form the sun, and then the rest of the material flattened down to form a disk, and inside of that disk you had uh, planets in, that formed out of that. This is very similar to the modern theory. So this is nothing new. It's been around more than two centuries. The modern theory isn't called this anymore. And it's been uh, a few more details put in, but basically the same idea. And so by 1880, many astronomers thought that these spiral nebulae that they saw, nebula is a word for cloud, by the way, they thought that these things were actually solar systems in the forming. These would be a few light years away from us within our own galaxy. In fact, if you were taking an astronomy class 100 years ago, uh, probably the teacher or professor would have shown you some photos or drawings of these things and would have said, here is proof of Laplace's theory of the formation of solar systems. Now, there was another idea put, um, so these were solar systems in the forming. Now, there's another, uh, another idea put forth shortly before Laplace. There was a Prussian uh, philosopher of the name of Immanuel Kant, who uh, put forth in the 18th century his idea we call the island universe. 
His idea was, we knew that our, our galaxy, the Milky Way, was laid out as a flat disk with probably a bulge in the middle, sort of, instead of being like a plate or a coin, maybe more like a, an over-easy egg. And so here's our galaxy, and Laplace said these, these things we're looking at are, are little spiral gas clouds within our own galaxy. Kant said, no, we've got our galaxy here, and Andromeda's over here, and the Sombrero and others are way over here, very far apart galaxies, millions of them, very far apart like islands, as it were. And they were using the word universe in a different sense than we talk about today. Back 100 years ago, people used the word galaxy, Milky Way, and universe synonymously. So you would have other universes. Today we would say other galaxies. And again, from about 1880 through the early 1920s, about four decades, this debate raged. But for the most part, the vast majority of astronomers supported Laplace's idea of the nebular hypothesis, and this is evidence of this. This all changed in 1924. By the way, in 1920, there was a very famous debate sponsored by the American Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C., between Heber Curtis and uh, Harlow Shapley. They argued this whole question, and uh, Shapley was a brilliant uh, astronomer at the time, up and coming. He argued for the uh, Laplace's idea, and Heber Curtis argued for uh, Emmanuel Kant's Island Universe theory. And by all accounts, uh, Shapley won easily because he had the better evidence. Turned out, four years later, Hubble showed that uh, Kant and Curtis were correct. How did, they, how did they prove this Island Universe theory? Well, he used what was then the largest telescope in the world. He took very long exposure photographs of M31, that galaxy I first showed you, and he was able to identify individual stars inside of this galaxy. Now these stars were barely visible, but they varied in brightness. And they, by observing them over several months, he could determine how they were varying in brightness. And he re recognized very quickly what kind of stars they were. They were Cepheid variables. Now Cepheid variables are well understood. They happen to be super giant and giant stars, very bright. And the fact that they were very faint told us one thing. They're very, very far away from us. And in one fell swoop, he showed an M31. It was very far away. He showed it for a few others. M31 happens to be the biggest and brightest and hence probably the closest one of these objects to us. So it, it naturally followed the rest of them were individual galaxies. So we went from thinking that the Milky Way was the only thing in the universe to a universe that was millions of times bigger. That's really quite a, an eye-opening experience, I think, and I, I'm surprised it didn't have a greater uh, in, impact philosophically on the way we view the world. This is another photograph of another galaxy. This is a, called a barred spiral. I like these. These are really pretty galaxies. They're called barred spirals. I think you have already see because they have a bar running across the middle, and the spiral arms, instead of coming directly off the nucleus, come off of this bar. And uh, there's been a lot of discussion over the years as exactly what barred spiral galaxies are and how they work. I don't think we've actually settled that issue yet. Very interesting question uh, there. Uh, there's an interesting interlude I'd like to just mention in, in, in passing here. Remember I mentioned that debate in 1920? Well, in 1920, they, in that debate, they used the work of a man named Adrian von Manen. He was a colleague of, uh, of, of Hubble. He worked at Mount Wilson Observatory with him in Southern California. And uh, what he did over seven, eight years, he took photographs with the largest telescopes in the world, the 60-inch and 100-inch telescopes at Mount Wilson. He took these photographs of several of these spiral nebulae, I'm putting it in quotes because we know they're galaxies now, and he examined photographs made five, six, seven years apart, and he found rotation. He'd take a photograph one year, come back five years later, and find that the thing had rotated a little bit. Now, if these things were nearby, um, uh, if these things were nearby galaxies, I mean, uh, were, were nearby objects, uh, with gas cloud forming to form planets, then you would expect in a few years' time you would see some rotation. But if these things were millions of light years away, the objects involved would take many uh, millions of years to make one orbit, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years to make one orbit. So in a, in a hundred years, you wouldn't see any kind of rotation. So the fact that he saw rotation indicated that they were nearby objects, not very distant ones. And of course, in 1924, 
that was all a moot point because Hubble showed that indeed they were distant objects. So very quickly became obvious that Adrian von Manen was seeing things. To be quite blunt, he was seeing rotations that did not exist. So what was he seeing? Just what did he see? He saw something that wasn't real, so why did he see it? What was he seeing? And this is a fantastic lesson for us as scientists, as creationists, evolutionists, whatever your worldview is, our worldview colors the way we look at things and what we expect. And my answer is, is he, he saw what he expected to see. He saw what he expected to see. His biases ran way ahead of him. And I think all of us do that. Are biases good or bad? The answer is yes. We all have biases, don't we? Is it, impo is it possible to be unbiased? If anybody claims to be unbiased, grab hold of your wallet and slowly walk out the door backwards while you're doing it, okay? Because they're selling you something real big. All right, the more they insist they're unbiased, the more you can be sure that they are biased, indeed. If you are biased and you understand what your biases are, then you can account for those. But if you, don't, if you deny you have any biases, you can't account for what doesn't exist, you see. So at any rate, this is a real, I think, an interesting sociological sort of thing, an observation about science. And you wondered why, you know, the entire world seems to, the scientific world seems to be going in the direction of evolution. It's because they expect to see it. They're, they're, they're confirming what they already know to be true. And, of course, we're doing the same thing. I won't apologize for that. I'm trying to confirm what I already know to be true. It's not so much you know, uh, your conclusion, it's oftentimes your assumption makes all the difference in the world. Okay, what about uh, Newton? He was a great scientist who lived uh, 350 years ago or so, 320 years ago, about three centuries ago. A great work at the end of the 17th century. And he, of course, looked at cosmology. What did Newton do, by the way? Anybody know? Okay, invented calculus. Laws of motion. Law of gravity. Optics, man, you guys are hitting all of them. Bam, 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 bam. You, those are the four things I would mention. Yeah. He was a theologian, okay. Most people won't mention that. He wrote ten times as much on theology, particularly the book of Daniel. He was fascinated with the book of Daniel. I don't know if the man was born again or not, but he certainly took the Bible very seriously, probably more seriously than anybody in this room right now. So he uh, was, was a devout man, uh, as near as I could tell. Um, he wrote a, fa a very famous book called the Principia, and it laid out in there as calculus and physics, um, basically all of mechanics, physics as we know it. If you take, you know, a sophomore level calculus-based physics, you're doing Newtonian physics, uh, at least part of it there. By the way, how old was he when he did when he finished up his best work? Twenty-two. <laughs> What have you done lately? <laughs> so, so Newton was an important individual. Alexander Pope, the great, uh, great English writer, uh, wrote, uh, and God said, let there be Newton, and there was light. Uh, so really, that was, it was amazing. You can, you, can, you can really birth physics with Newton, because he, he invented physics, as we know. A brilliant man, uh, one of the three best mathematical minds that ever existed, as far as we can tell. Uh, however, as near as I can tell, he believed that the universe is eternal. Where did he get that? From the Greeks. Apparently, he liked Daniel. He didn't read Genesis a whole lot, or he looked at Genesis the wrong way, but he got this from the Greeks. And I, I don't want to be too harsh on the man because he was a product of his time. And uh, it's kind of hard to go against the, the general thinking at the time. Now, he applied his theory of gravity to uh, all things in the universe. And he realized that if you had some finite size to the universe, here's all the matter in the universe. In simplicity, I'll, I'll say it's spherical. It doesn't have to be, but for simplicity, we'll say that there's a, it's spherical. Now, there would be a center to all of this, and gravity is going to work in such a way that it's going to pull everything towards that center. If you're near the edge of this, you're going to be pulled by everything over this direction and nothing this direction, so it's going to pull you that way, isn't it? over on this side, it's going to pull you this direction and not that direction. So everything's going to be pulled toward the center, and eventually everything will end up in a heap at the center. Now, does the universe look like that? 
No, it has. It doesn't look like that at all. So if the universe is eternal, it's had plenty of time for this to happen, but it hasn't happened. So you've got one or two possible, well, three possibilities. Newtonian gravity is wrong. I, I think he was prepared, not prepared to admit that, and I would agree with that. He could argue that the universe is not eternal, but he wasn't prepared to admit that. The third possibility is that the universe is infinite. Now, remember I said we can imagine a spherical distribution of matter. Let's suppose that the universe is infinite in every direction. So, is there any center anymore? Well, there is no center. If you're sitting here, you have a huge amount of matter pulling you in this direction, the gravity of that matter pulling in this direction, but you have an equal amount of matter pulling you in that direction, so there's no net attraction this way, is there? Ditto for this direction, ditto for that direction, and so what you, what you end up with is a static universe. When we say static universe, we mean that the objects in the, in the universe are not collecting or flying apart. They're just more or less sitting still. They might be moving a little bit here and there, random motions, but there is no general overall motion to the universe. It's not flying apart. It's not falling together. And this gave rise then to the static universe. If it's static, it's going to last in that way forever, virtually. So he, he developed this idea of an infinite universe based upon the eternality of the universe. Well, Newton did his gravity around 1670 or thereabouts, and that was the dominant theory of gravity for more than two centuries. By the early 20th century, it became obvious that there were a few problems here, and so he did a modification. A guy named Albert Einstein, you may have heard of him, came along. Uh, uh, he uh, came along in the early 20th century, and he, around 1915, it's been 90 years now, hard to believe, uh, he came up with this theory we call general relativity. I took a course in this once, and I uh, can't say that I really followed much of the thing, but it was interesting, and I've read up on my own a few times. To do it right with the mathematics is really, really tough. I think one great astronomer back early in the 20th century uh, said that, uh, commenting on relativity, that they were, there were only three men in the world who understood uh, the theory. Uh, one was dead, and he couldn't remember the other one, who he was. So it was uh, a really, really a tough thing. I don't think it's quite that bad, but it's almost that bad. Um, I'll very quickly explain to you what general relativity is about, okay, in just about 30 or 40 seconds, all right? Okay, a little more than that, but not much more. In, um, in Newtonian gravity, you have an object here, an object here, say the earth and the moon, the sun and the earth, me and the rest of the earth, whatever. <clears throat> and the two objects attract each other. And there's an equation that Newton wrote. I'll give it to you in words real fast if you like it. Every object in the universe attracts every other object with a force directly proportional to the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distances between them. You got that? Test later. All right. So that's his mathematical model. The, the upshot is this. These two objects reach through empty space. From the sun and the, and the earth, it's 93 million miles. They reach through empty space and the earth happens to know then through a totally empty space where the sun is and how much mass it has, how far away it is, how, what, uh, what, what its distance is, and on the base of that magically knows how much gravity there is between the two. That's, that's amazing. We call it action at a distance. There's something, there's a problem. If we want to know more fundamentally, how does that information get transmitted between the sun and the earth? So, what uh, general relativity says is that space and time, remember they're, they're things, in, in Newtonian sense they're not things really, they're a backdrop, but now we're saying they're, they're these entities that are, are, are actually more of a substance than many people realized before. And uh, you can imagine being like a fabric or like graph paper or something like this. And whenever you place energy or matter in the presence of this space and time, it uh, affects that space and time we would say that it bends it or warps it, it shaped, changes the shape of this thing. Now this bending is in a direction we really can't perceive. You can have higher dimensionalities than the three spatial and one time that we have, but it would bend space and time in a way that we can't see. But as we move forward through space and time, through that curved space and time, we, uh, we react in a way because of that curved space and time that we perceive to be an acceleration of gravity. 
So what happens is the sun's sitting here, and it, it affects space and time around it, and that's how that information about where it is, how much mass it is, uh, gets to the earth, and the earth then responds naturally. So it gives us a more fundamental way of understanding how that information between two distant bodies, gravitation-wise, gets transmitted. And for most cases, general relativity and Newtonian gravity produce the same results. There are some limiting conditions where the two diverge, and that's where the interesting physics comes in and the testing comes in. But it's just a different way of looking at this and expressing what we know, to, what we know as gravity. Well, not long after he published it, about the time he did publish it, Einstein applied this to the entire universe just like Newton did. And this is one of the quirks, one of the differences that comes about. Remember I said in the case of a finite universe uh, in Newtonian physics, everything gets attracted to the center. But if you have an infinite universe, there is no center, and so you end up with a static universe. Well, what Einstein very quickly found when he applied this to the whole universe was it didn't work out that well. Even if you had an infinite universe, there was still a tendency for the matter in the universe to attract itself and contract it down and make it get smaller. In other words, everything should fall into a heap, even in an infinite universe, if general relativity works. So Einstein looks around the world, and he sees the world isn't like that, does he? So he has a problem. Well, what he did is he threw in this anti-gravity term. Sounds like Star Trek stuff. Put on those anti-gravity boots, you know, all this kind of stuff. And uh, we, we use the Greek letter lambda to describe this. It's called the cosmological constant. Now, later on, people dissed him pretty badly. He later on said this is the greatest blunder he ever made. He's a little harsh on himself because you see, well, when you solve these things, you're solving differential equations. Anybody here had Diffy Q before? Oh, a good number of you have. You know, nod your head in agreement if you agree with this statement. When you solve a differential equation, you're doing an integral basically, don't you always have a constant of integration come out of this? I'm seeing some nods, okay. Now oftentimes that constant is zero, but sometimes it's not. And what Einstein did was he said, I'm going to set this constant equal to some non-zero value. And most people said it ought to be zero. Why? Because that beauty dictates that. Beauty, of course, trumps truth many times when it comes to physics. All right, so they, everybody thought it ought to be equal to zero, but it turns out it is, uh, having this extra term in there, is a physically meaningful term. And what it physically means in, in the Einstein's approach to it was that space itself repelled itself. It acted like an anti-gravity, if you will. Space tends to just can't stand itself and tends to push your things apart and gravity would tend to pull them back together again and if you balance those two you end up with a static universe so you save that static eternal universe so he was adding stuff on it for the wrong reasons what you should do is do this by observations but he wasn't doing that he was doing it philosophically and mathematically as it were well, okay, a guy named De Sitter came along right after Einstein in the 1920s, actually, right on the heels of what he did. And, and um, what he did is he took general relativity, same thing Einstein had done, and Einstein missed his, missed his opportunity here. And that's the reason why he kicked himself the rest of his life over this. De Sitter was the show, showed that the, in the general form, the universe tends to have two solutions. Either it's contracting, we've already talked about, or it's expanding. Einstein wanted it halfway in between, neither expanding nor contracting. But De Sitter was the first to show that Einstein's own theories, when you solve them for the universe, it meant the universe is contracting or it's expanding. Which one it's actually doing is a matter of observation. That's what you do in Diffie Q anyway. You simply have to observe the world and then uh, your boundary conditions and set those in here. And uh, 1929, Edwin Hubble, we met him five years earlier with the island universe theory idea, you can understand why Hubble's such an important guy. He had several great contributions. He's just two of them. And he discovered the expansion of the universe. He found that things were getting farther apart. Now, he didn't do this in a vacuum. He knew about De Sitter's work, Einstein's work, actually a couple other people, as well as a guy named Vesto Slipher, who was knocking on the door of this thing 15 years earlier. But I won't tell you about him right now. All right. Uh, 
And since they found out the universe was expanding, they threw out the need for uh, lambda. That's cosmological constant. That's when Einstein started kicking himself and everybody else started joining in too. And uh, 1922, but even before uh, this was established uh, by Hubble, 1922, Alexander Friedman, a brilliant uh, Russian uh, mathematician, worked out the details of the uh, models without any lambda, without any cosmological constant. We call these Friedman universes. And that's uh, sort of been the standard model and really up to modern times. Uh, one of the persons I should mention is uh, Georges Lemaitre, a uh, uh, Belgian priest. He was also a scientist, a physicist. A lot of people don't realize that there are priests who are scientists. And uh, many people don't even know. How many of you knew that the Vatican has an observatory? A few of you do. They, they have a new station they're, they're constructing in Arizona. So, I mean, many people are surprised. I got a colleague of mine who's, who's Catholic, and he discovered they had a Vatican observatory. He started getting mailings. He keeps putting them in my box at, at school because he thinks this is really interesting, which he thought he was telling me something I didn't know. But it is kind of an obscure thing. But there are a lot of uh, priests who are scientists. Anyway, back in the 1920s, he put forth the first, first elements of what we, in modern theory, we now know as the Big Bang. He called it the cosmic egg. His idea was that all the matter in the universe was collected together and then popped open from this egg and expanded to what we have today. And again, if you know much about the Big Bang model, you'll know, you'll recognize that as the essential elements of that model. And as Lemaitre was concerned, he was trying to find God in all this. He was, uh, he didn't believe in a literal six-day creation, obviously, uh, as we do, or a few thousand years old, but he did believe in a theistic beginning of the universe. And so you can say the first elements of the Big Bang Theory were put forth by a person trying to argue for the existence of the universe through God's creation. And, of course, this meant a finite age. That is, the universe was not eternal. Now, if you go for 20th centuries plus, believing the universe is eternal, how well do you take this news? Well, not very well, and so it was resisted quite a bit. But that's the upshot, is, is uh, you either have a universe of this type with a finite age, or you try to cast about for something else, and cast they did. Let me show you a couple pictures here. This is actually from the 1929 paper by Edwin Hubble, uh, where he discovered the expansion of the universe. I'll very quickly illustrate what, uh, what he has here. You'll notice on the vertical scale here, velocity, this is zero, 500 kilometers per second, 1,000 kilometers per second, it's increasing as you go upward. I don't know why I didn't put per second there, but it is velocity. And then the distance over here is in parsecs. This is zero, a million parsecs, two million parsecs. A parsec is about three and a quarter light years. So a million parsecs would be three and a quarter million light years, this would be two times that, what about seven and a half, or six and a half uh, million light years. And you'll notice that as you go to the right, the distances increase, as you go upward, the velocities increase, and there's a fairly straight line running like this. That is, the smaller distances have the smaller velocities, the higher distances have the higher velocities. If you plot all these up, these dots and circles, are data points for various galaxies that Hubble studied. And you'll see that there's a fairly straight linear relationship right there. And that's what you would expect to find if indeed the universe is expanding. The farther away something is, the, uh, the, the faster it has to move to be there. Imagine a road race, like a 10 kilometer road race. And if you observe, you fly over in a helicopter and you watch, or maybe just standing at the starting line and watching after, say, 20 minutes into the race, which people are farthest from the starting line? The faster runners. How do they get to be so far away? They can run faster than anybody else. Who are, who, which people are closest to the starting line? The slower ones, and it, and it runs a nice relationship in between. You want to find out how fast somebody's running on average? Look at their distance. That'll tell you immediately, won't it? So there's a nice relationship. The closer you are, the slower you're moving, the farther away you are, the faster you're moving. So if the universe is expanding, it must follow this kind of relationship. And so this kind of relationship proved that the universe is expanding. Yes? That's where my analogy to the race fails. You, you don't have to have a, a center to the universe. That's a hard concept to, to nail down, and maybe I'll try to handle that with you if I can. 
from, from the earth. If the universe is, uh, is, has no center, then any point you pick will be as good as any other point. It's like if you want to measure distances on the surface of the earth, any reference point you want to pick. I prefer Lancaster, South Carolina myself, all right, for obvious reasons. And you're going you're gonna to uh, pick Seattle or some other place like that. Any point is good for any other point. There is no center to the surface of the earth, except philosophically. <clears throat> this is a photograph of the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson. Uh, looks pretty old today, but back 100 years ago, 80 years ago, this would have been uh, cutting edge the technology. This is one of the most significant telescopes in the world. I think more great discoveries were made with this telescope than any other, save the very first one that Galileo used. And this is uh, Hubble, uh, I believe at the prime focus of the 100-inch telescope. Again, this photograph probably made about 70, 80 years ago. Interesting thing, I understand that uh, he was born in Missouri, and uh, so he's from the Midwest, but uh, he affected an English accent, took up a pipe, had patches on his, on his uh, jacket and things like this. He really liked uh, putting on the dog as being uh, a little more sophisticated. I didn't think being from the Midwest was a very sophisticated thing. I don't know why he'd think that. Okay, the, uh, <clears throat> I grew up in the Midwest. Okay, be careful here, all right? Do you know what a buckeye is, by the way? It's a worthless nut. All right. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to take it for, for as a given that the universe is expanding. I think Hubble showed that pretty clearly, discovered by 1928. He actually discovered it in 28, published it in 29. And um, it was predicted as early as 1917, and I think De Sitter may have actually written on that around 1917. Uh, I believe Einstein published his work in 1916, so it was right on the heels of that. And um, two main theories begin to be developed then in the wake of this great discovery in the 20s. Um, one of them is the steady state theory, which I'll describe here briefly in just a moment. And the other is the Big Bang. You're probably more familiar with it. I've already, I've already um, alluded it, and I'll talk about it a little bit more here. All right, the steady state universe. What's it all about? Well, the, it's a belief that the universe is eternal. Where do you suppose they got that idea? The ancient Greeks again. And what re I think what's really feeding this idea of eternality is the fact that if the universe is eternal, then there was no beginning. If there's no beginning, there is no beginner, or is there? So this is the ultimate atheistic theory. If you, want to, if you believe the universe is eternal, you're usually doing that to avoid the nastiness of having yourself to be accountable to a creator. So make no mistake, that's really the stakes involved there. Um, now, as you universe is expanding, you would expect then the density to decrease, wouldn't it? As you get farther and farther apart, things would get less and less dense. And of course, if that happened over a long enough time, the universe would be infinitely extended, so there's no density left at all. We don't, the universe doesn't look like that, does it? So uh, what they hypothesized in the steady state theory is that as the universe expanded, the density remained the same. As the universe expands, the density remains the same. Now, if that seems to violate everything you remember from mathematics and physics, you're right. But the way they avoided that problem is to hypothesize that matter spontaneously pops into existence. All right, now people start snickering at this and say, this is, sounds really silly. Why don't you like that? Because it violates what? Conservation of matter. You know, matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Now, that's true, but hang on a second. How do we know the conservation of matter is true? Did somebody come down off of Mount Oreb without inscribing stone? I got a beard. I could do that, couldn't I? No, I don't look like Charlton Heston. It wouldn't work. All right. So, so how do we know that that's true? Well, what we've done is we've done countless experiments half of the way. And what we, what we find out in all these experiments is that when we start with so much matter, we end with so much matter, and it's the same amount of matter, isn't it? But suppose that in the volume of this room, this is a good size auditorium, suppose in the volume of this auditorium, uh, in a year's time, one hydrogen atom popped into existence. Would you notice that? I would suggest you'd probably escape your notice, wouldn't it? If you run the numbers, you'll find out the amount of matter they need on average would be about one hydrogen atom 
per volume of this room. So I would submit to you that our conservation of matter could simply be an approximation to the truth. What could be really going on in the universe is conservation of density. So you've got a choice. Either you can say that total matter in the universe is absolutely conserved, most of us opt for that, or you could argue that you have absolute conservation of average density in the universe. You can pick, pick which one you want, and you really cannot tell which one's true or not. So we, we tend to think one's true and the other one's bogus, but the people who really get into this think that either one's obvious, it could be true, and I, I would have to agree with them. Uh, there's no way of telling which one's true, however. That's the problem. This had great appeal right into the 1960s, again, because I think of atheistic uh, assumptions and lack of accountability thereof, if you have a, this sort of idea. Now, I said in the 1960s, after about 1965, something happened in 1965 which changed the world on this. Let's talk about the Big Bang universe, and you'll see what that is in just a minute that did change the world. Uh, what's going on here? Well, the universe has a finite age, unlike the, the, the uh, steady state theory. And as the uh, universe expands, density decreases with time. Obviously, in this model, you're assuming that the sum total of matter remains constant. I think most of you would agree with that and like that better, and I'd have to agree with you. Probably that's, that's more reasonable. And another thing that happens is as the universe expands, the temperature also has to decrease. Think of the universe as being a gas. What happens? In fact, most of the matter in the universe is a gas. So as you expand a gas, what happens to the temperature? It cools, doesn't it? Okay, it cools. So the universe should get cooler and cooler with time, and so eventually it will get a lot cooler than it, than it is uh, right now. But in the past, what happened to the temperature? It was much hotter. Well, one prediction made as early as 1948, George Gamow made this prediction in 1948, is that uh, there was a period of time a few hundred thousand years after the universe, when the uh, began in the Big Bang, which the universe... Uh, uh, then would have a temperature of about 3,000 Kelvin overall and would be dense and hot enough that uh, hydrogen would be uh, ionized. It wouldn't exist as atoms yet. But then when it cooled down to a certain temperature around 3,000 Kelvin, the electrons and the protons combined for the first time to form hydrogen atoms. Prior to that time, the electrons would have scattered photons of light and so you would have been in like in a bright fog. You couldn't see a hand in front of your face because those electrons between you and your hand would have absorbed and re-emitted the light many times. But after those electrons and protons combined, the universe became transparent. And so a second after that happened, you could see a light second away. You'd see a big wall of light a light second away, but there'd be a big wall there. A year later, you could see a light year away, and you'd see a big wall of light there. Ten years later, you could see ten light years away and so forth. Now we're looking at it billions and billions of years later. We can see billions of light years away. We're going to see this big bright wall except for one thing. The universe has expand, expanded a thousand fold since then. And so instead of seeing a 3,000 Kelvin temperature big wall, we're going to see about a 3 Kelvin, which is very cold, by the way. It's going to be in the microwave. We're not even going to see that with our own eyes. And this has been called the cosmic background radiation, sometimes called the CMB, the cosmic mi uh, microwave background. Same thing. Same thing. I've, I've noticed in recent years they've changed over from CBR to CMB, and I've not made the change yet. I don't know why they've changed, but uh, that's what's happening. This is predicted in 1948, and George Gamow got excited about it, and then he realized something. You know what the problem was? This is in the microwave. The technology for measuring this didn't yet exist. It wasn't until 15 years later in the early 1960s that it did. And uh, two uh, men at uh, the Bell Labs in New Jersey named Penzias and Wilson uh, actually stumbled across this thing, weren't even looking for it, they were looking for something else, stumbled across this thing, published their results in 1965, January issue of the Astrophysical Journal Letters, the companion paper by uh, Robert Dickey from Princeton who was just starting to look for this thing. And the rest is history. A dozen years later, they won the Nobel Prize in Physics for an accidental discovery. Imagine that. That's the best way to win a Nobel Prize. I'm sure it's the only way I will win one. Uh, all right. This is a, uh, this is a uh, frequency, uh, excuse me, a, a, a spectrum of the, of the background radiation from various sources. You can have here different experiments running from the COBE satellite and other uh, balloon-borne and other things. 
And you have here uh, the little, little blue squares are up here. They're real close together. All these little blue squares are right here. That comes from Kobe data. Uh, the X's come from Kobe data as well. The little zeros from another experiment and a few others down here, different places. And you'll notice this nice curve that they have. And there's this dotted line right here. This dotted line running right here, that's a theoretical fit. And the theoretical fit is to a 2.726 Kelvin black body. And I think you'll agree that that is one very good fit to the data. This thing has a very uniform temperature. Very cool, but still a uniform temperature. And it's coming from every direction in space. That's what had Penzias and Wilson banging their heads against the wall for six months or more. This thing was coming from every direction. Same temperature, absolutely uniform. And uh, you see, in the, in the steady state theory, there never was a period of time when the universe had this much higher temperature. So the steady state theory can't explain this. The Big Bang theory predicts it. Now, when Gamow made his prediction, he, he, he suggested it was between 2 and 20 Kelvin. He had no idea exactly what temperature it would be, but he, he, he predicted some range. We found it near the lower end of that range. Impressive bit of result here. So uh, what happened after 1965 is since the Big Bang couldn't explain it, then people dropped it like a hot potato, and uh, we've had the Big Bang model as the only game in town for the past four decades. I don't think that's a very healthy sort of situation. We need to have a multiplicity of ideas uh, for something like this, and I think it's bred some problems in Big Bang thinking. Well, by the way, Sir Fred Hoyle was the, uh, now the late Sir Fred Hoyle was one of the big proponents of the steady state, and to his dying day a couple, three years ago, uh, he was still working on a um, steady state theory that would produce this background radiation. Never was able to do that. Okay, once you decide that the universe uh, has a Big Bang beginning, <coughs> and uh, uh, then it had to have a beginning sometime in the past, the question arises, how long ago was that? And the easiest way to do this is to find what we call the Hubble time, which is simply one over the Hubble constant. The Hubble constant, I haven't mentioned that yet, but that's the, remember that line I showed you of the Hubble's data from 1929? We've upped that data quite a bit over the last uh, 80 years, but... Uh, that slope of that line is the Hubble constant. It measures or tells us how rapidly the universe is expanding. If you take one over the reciprocal of that expansion rate, it tells you how long ago the universe uh, came into existence in the Big Bang, according to this model. This is the first approximation. I'll explain why it's just the first approximation in just a minute. Uh, really, from the 19, about 1960 through the early 1990s, we were pretty certain that the Hubble constant was 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Uh, if you do that, you find the Hubble time is 20 billion years. And as, again, it's an overestimate, as it turns out. And so for much of my life, they'd say the universe began 16 to 18 billion years ago in a Big Bang. They got that figure from this. They knew 20 billion was the outside number. And uh, actually, the existence of matter in the universe would decrease that a little bit. Now, uh, in, more, uh, in the last decade or so, we've, we've upped the number. If you went to 100, like some people wanted, it would decrease the Hubble time to 10 billion years. Uh, they now have settled that the Hubble constant's around 80 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And uh, so it's going to be somewhere between 10 and 20 billion years, more like 12, 13, 14 billion years. Now, deceleration will change that. What is deceleration? Remember, the universe is expanding, but the, 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 uh, the matter in the universe tends to contract everything, kind of slows down the expansion. So the universe is expanding, but matter, the gravity of the matter in the universe tends to slow it down. So that's the reason why the Hubble constant, uh, the, Hub the Hubble time is an overestimate. The existence of matter will tend to slow that down. So they were arguing, again, 16 to 18 billion years as the age of the universe. If they got it down to 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec, instead of being 10 billion years, it would have been closer to 8 billion for the age of the, uh, of the universe. Uh, the most modern value is that the, uh, the, the universe is 13 billion, 700 million, and two years old. <clears throat> the two years comes from the fact that this result was announced two years ago. So it's aged two years since then. So uh, I'm really impressed with this, uh, this precision here, plus or minus 1%. I've, I've never been a time that they've, they've claimed this high of precision. But of course, just uh, 15 years ago, they were saying 16 to 18 uh, billion years. You'll notice that the 
precision there does not match the, the overlap here at all. So I'm not optimistic that this, this figure will stand in 10 years' time either. Okay, what about evidences for the Big Bang? Uh, you know, it seems to be the only game in town, so there must be all sorts of proof for that. Well, if you uh, cut through the books and read through them, there are three basic evidences given. The existence of the cosmic background radiation. I've already mentioned that, what it is, and the fact that it is a prediction of the model. Uh, number two, they argue that the universe is expanding. And so that's a prediction of the model, so therefore that's, uh, that proves it. And number three, the abundance of the light elements also matches. The predictions of the Big Bang model match the observations, so therefore that's evidence of it. Actually, I've seen people put together a bigger lists than that. In a discussion group I'm on about a year ago, somebody put forth about eight or nine, and I went through and I said, look, actually these three are just variations of this one, and these four are just variations of this one. And I said, would you agree then that these are just down to three basic ideas? The person, well, yeah, basically. So sometimes they'll try to pad the numbers. It's like padding the resume, you know, you, you make it appear more important than it really is. And so sometimes they'll try to expand these. But make no mistake, these are the only three evidences really given uh, for the Big Bang. Let's examine these very quickly. I've already talked about the cosmic background radiation. It's a prediction of the model. What about the universe is expanding? Well, keep in mind that this is a fact that the Big Bang was devised to explain. Okay? Let me illustrate this for you. My neighbor is outside throwing orange peels over his yard. So I go out and I say, Billy Ray, what are you doing? He says, I'm throwing orange peels in the yard. I said, I know I can see that, but why are you doing that? And he said, I'll have to keep the elephants away. Billy Ray, there's not an elephant within a hundred miles of here. To which he says, See, it works. <laughs> so, the universe is expanding. We devised the Big Bang Theory to explain that, uh, that expansion. And the fact that the universe is expanding proves the Big Bang Theory, doesn't it? I'm telling you folks, books, many books on the Big Bang, many textbooks, actually use this as evidence of the Big Bang. This is circular reasoning. We all recognize this, you know, from creation studies in general, but it's just amazing that, that, that people don't get this. Again, remember, the, uh, the expansion was predicted as early as 1917, observed in 1928, 1929, but, you know, go back and claim it as proof is hardly proof of this. And not only that, other, thing, other theories can explain the expansion. Like, using this reasoning, doesn't the steady state theory predict the expansion just as much as the Big Bang does? Yeah. So if you're going to claim that expansion proves the Big Bang, you're going to have to also agree that expansion proves the steady state theory. So this is no prediction at all. This is no prediction at all. It's just, it's just simply a, 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 a smoke and mirrors. Okay, what about the abundance of the light elements? So here's the deal is here. The, the Big Bang theory says the universe starts off with hydrogen, helium, and a trifling little bit of lithium. In fact, back in the 1950s, they were trying to make the Big Bang Theory explain carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and iron and calcium and silicon and all these sort of things, things in our body, for instance. And they couldn't do it. In fact, it was in 1957, they finally figured out a way they could produce these heavier, heavier elements. What happens to the Big Bang? There's nice physics going on here. Why? And if you want to know later on, I'll tell you about it, how this happens. But great physics... Uh, explaining uh, why you can't get heavier elements out of the Big Bang. So what we do is, and in, in the astronomers uh, since 1957 have argued that uh, these heavier elements such as carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and iron and calcium and all these things are produced inside of stars these, uh, through thermonuclear reactions that power them. These stars blow up, spew this material back out into space. It gets collected into new stars which then repeat the process, and gradually the amount of heavier elements in the universe increases. We call this chemical enrichment. And this is why some people uh, claim that it took God you know, more than 10 billion years to get around creating us, because early on there wasn't enough iron and calcium, this sort of stuff, to make our bodies. 
I think this really boxes God in quite a bit to make that case. Also, it's very interesting, they're now finding at great distances in the universe, we're looking at infant galaxies early in the universe, we're finding carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and iron, all those sorts of things. And uh, that really has not dawned on many astronomers yet, but there's a real problem here in this whole idea. But I'll let that go for the time being. All right, so uh, you produce these things. Now, uh, well, the claim is made that uh, what you do is you use the Big Bang model to predict how much hydrogen, helium, and lithium would be produced by the Big Bang model. And you go out and you measure hydrogen, helium, lithium we think is out there in space. And wouldn't you know it, the two agree. Isn't that a great prediction? Well, if only it were true. Because what's actually happened here is that people went out and... See, the Big Bang is not just a simple single model. It's actually a whole suite of models. You can change this and change that. It's a very plastic sort of thing. There are thousands of variations of the Big Bang. And what they did is they went out and they measured hydrogen, helium, and lithium. They then took the data and put it into the model, turned the crank, and it uh, then gave them the abundances. In other words, this is orange peel time again. Or, if you want to, they gave the answers to the model before they started. You know, if you give me the answers to a test, I will ace that test. You know, only a real dummy would not ace the test if you gave them the answers beforehand. So that my, uh, my objection here is that these abundances were used to produce the model. You can't, you know, fudge, give the data to the model, and then claim that your predictions of the model match the observations. Well, duh, it better. Wouldn't it be terrible if you, if you gave the data to the model and the model ended up going off some other direction with it? So this is, uh, this is not, not good at all. So uh, review those evidences for the Big Bang. The CBR, this is a good prediction. It was predicted 15 years before its discovery, if not quantitatively correct, qualitatively it was. And, and I think we have to admit this and deal with this. But as far as the others, the universe is expanding, that's no prediction. Uh, Buns the light elements, this is no prediction either. So uh, actually, there's only one bit of evidence for the Big Bang model, the existence of the cosmic background radiation. I think we as creationists, if we don't believe in the Big Bang, we need to... Uh, explain what the background radiation is. If it's not from the remnant of the Big Bang, the age of recombination a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, then we have to come up with some other plausible explanation, and I don't think we've done that yet. But I'm optimistic that we can do that with time. All right. Uh, I've been going an hour. Should I quit or should I go on a little longer? Is that the Big Bang supposedly happened everywhere. It's just that everywhere wasn't as big as back then as it is now. Okay, so the universe pops. You're going to measure my motion towards you, or if I move away, you're going to measure it moving away from you. Because I'm moving. I'm moving towards you, aren't I? So I'm moving with respect to you. This is a space. The, the carpet here on the stage is the space. So I'm moving with respect to that space. Well, imagine that all the objects are sitting still with respect to space. Most of you are sitting here in your chairs, and you're not moving around the room, are you? All right, now imagine what would happen if space begins to expand. These are not Doppler motions, but suppose it begins to expand. For instance, we unhook these chairs, but you're still not moving the chairs around. Suppose the floor is made out of a rubber sheet, and you've got some machinery beyond the walls where it starts pulling on that rubber sheet and starts stretching all that rubber. Would you get farther apart from one another? As the rubber in the floor expands, it will carry you away, even though you're not moving. You're not, you're not moving, walking across this rubber sheet, but the rubber sheet is expanding, full, pulling you further apart. And this is what you have to imagine is happening. Universal expansion is pulling, everything, pulling space apart. Space is stretching, which causes distant things to get farther apart. Even close by things get farther apart, but they don't get as far apart as rapidly as more distant objects do, because they've got more space between them to stretch.